announcement, uh, the bulletin uh, was a misprint. And so if you are looking at your bulletin, it's going to reflect last week. Uh, if you would like to see this week's bulletin, you can use your phone to scan the code, and that will lead you to this week's bulletin. Or you can just look and follow the service up um, on the wall. We'll get started here in just a few seconds. Akiyemi's Mr. Isaac is going to sit with you. <laughs> Sorry. Stand and sing with us. A mighty fortress is our God. A Hey, welcome to Redeemer. 
My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. And the, the song that we just sang was actually written by a guy named Martin Luther. And he had a friend named Philip Melanchthon who uh, struggled with anxiety. He was a very anxious soul. And he's often uh, recorded as getting so anxious that Martin Luther would have to like sit down. And, and he, would, he would oftentimes sit down with Philip and say, Philip, uh, remember who is in charge of everything. Remember that we believe in a kingdom that, that won't fail. And he, would, he was often uh, times quoted as saying, Come, Philip, let's sing the 46th Psalm, um, which is what we just sang for A Mighty Fortress. And ultimately, you know, as you walk through this life, there's, there's all sorts of things to, to look at. I mean, if you, if you look on the news, even what happened uh, yesterday in the Middle East, um, but if you th- think about your life or, or the community that you find yourself in, there's so many things to get anxious about. There's so many things to worry about. There's so many things to look at and be depressed about. Um, But ultimately, the lot of a human being is to find peace and rest and even delight in God, um, that you will be in His presence and find what what we're going to talk about uh, today in the sermon, the oil of gladness. And that's what Psalm 16 is about, that ultimately, the lot of a human being, the circumstances, the providence of your life, is that you will enjoy God and He will enjoy you forever. And that's what Sunday's about. It's, a, it's about practicing what's, what will be true of you in a billion years. And it's so easy to forget that. And so that's why we need a call back into worship, because we're so focused on our circumstances, and our circumstances are real. What you feel is real. Um, but what's more real is a kingdom that can't be shaken. And so that's why we call each other into worship from the Psalms oftentimes. And so let's stand, let's stand and sing, uh, repeat Psalm 16. And this is just such a beautiful, a beautiful psalm. So let's uh, say this together. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. You make known to me the path of life. And in your presence, there is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's continue in worship. Father, I long to be wise, to see with new eyes the truth that was written by your hand. Father, speak truth into me cause I still believe you will help me understand we are listening to your word we are listening to your word morning and evening we come to faith to hear that the word has come that the word is here father i long to see christ truth and new life the word that made the universe father speak now i believe I have been set free by the word that lived and died for me. We are listening to your word. We are listening to your word. Morning and evening we come to delight in the words of our God. Give us eyes to see, give us faith to hear, that the word has come, that the word is here. Give 
gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is holy bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. with me. Father, you are magnificent beyond compare. You are glorious. You are worthy of our adoration. We take everything in the forefront of our minds and we set it aside to focus solely on you, to recognize your goodness, to revel in your glory, to let you radiate our beings with the beam of your sunshine and to feel what it is to be part of your church. We adore you. Amen. Turn and greet your neighbor.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I make your way to your seats and your conversations. We're going to sing that one more time. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Good morning, Redeemer. Y'all can take a seat. I wore my sunglasses up here so I can look extra cool doing announcements. Um, If you are new here, my name is Claire Shin, um, and I am so happy to be here with you. And so is Don Marie. So um, I was told to announce, which is funny because I brought this up to do the announcements, um, but this bulletin is incorrect. Um, It has the wrong date, um, some incorrect information in here. Um, And so you can scan the QR code to get the correct bulletin um, for all the great announcements that I am going to announce today. And there are only two. Um, First one is Children's Church, um, pre-K and kindergarten, is in the west side of the portable, and first and third, first through third, is in the east side. Um, And then the only other announcement, which this is a really good one, um, and I'm just going to read it straight from the bulletin, because that is a great practice for all of us to be in. Um, But Friday and Saturday, October 13th and 14th, um, is the Father and Children Annual Campout at Branched Oak Lake. Cue cheer from Don Marie. Yeah. (laughs) All right. We will have dinner um, at 6 p.m. People can arrive earlier. Um, There's going to be a campfire, s'mores, breakfast um, the next morning. You can also just come for Friday night if you want to, um, if you don't want to bring a tent to spend the night. Um, There will be a cost. Your car will need a state park permit, um, and that's $25 per family if you end up camping, and $15 per family if you just come for dinner. Um, You can let David Patras know if you are coming, and he will make sure you stay in the loop on everything. So now I will go ahead and pray for our offering. Dear Lord, thank you so much um, just for another beautiful fall day to be together, to worship together. Um, I pray for our offering today, and just thank you for... Um, this regular reminder that we have to be good stewards of our time and our talent and our treasures. Um, I pray that you would just use this offering today um, and from every week to do things that are incredible and maybe sometimes unbelievable um, to spread your light in Lincoln and throughout the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Our mouths, they were filled, filled with laughter. Our tongues, they were loosed, loosed with joy. Restore us, O Lord. 
Restore us, O oh Lord. Although we are weeping, Lord, help us keep sowing the seeds of your kingdom for the day you will reap them. Your sheaves we will carry. in uh, the series and through, throughout the book of Esther, and we're coming to the end of the book of Esther, and we have been, over the past five weeks, mainly focusing on the self, and that is embodied in the person of Haman, and what the self does to a human being, and how antithetical to, to God the self is when it's left unchecked. Now, within our story, we are uh, going to move over to chapter 9, where the institution of this feast called Purim is um, instituted in, in the, the Jewish culture, the Jewish tradition. And we're going to talk about what it means to have a return or restoration of wholeness, um, not only as individuals, but, but as a community. And um, I'm going to read this short section. We're only going to be focusing on verses 20 through 23 mainly, um, but this is sort of the example or the institution of this feast called Purim. And so this is in Esther 9, verses 1, and then we're going to skip down to verse 20 through 26a. And so this is God's word to you today. Now, in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred, and the Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. Now skip down to verse 20. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Xerxes, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same year by year. Adar is March, by the way. And as these days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies or rest from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. 
So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is, cast lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in, written, in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that his and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, they called these days Purim, after the term pure. So um, that's a, a very brief summary of what the entire book of Esther is about, those verses right there. And so I'm going to um, spend some moments in silence. Our practice here at Redeemer is to sit in silence and ask God for a particular thing. And, and one of the things that I want us to ask God for this morning is that he would make you aware of what we're going to call your lot in life that you become aware of the story that's God, that God's writing in your life in the past and also in the present, and how that particular lot in life is going to help you face what's coming in the future. Um, and so let's pray towards that end, and then we'll talk about this text. Pray with me. Lord, it is good to be in the presence of your people, and what was just sung, that our uh, souls that may have gone out uh, weeping and sowing tears into the ground will actually come home with shouts of joy. And um, Lord, I do ask that you would show us this morning that you have been that type of faithful God in the past in each of our individual stories, whether we've seen it or not and that you are calling us in the present to wait and to remember who you are and to remember that our lot has been redeemed in the past and will be again in the future. And that tension that we hold right now is, is hard. It's very easy, Lord, to seek to alleviate it outside of you, seek to alleviate the, the tension that we feel maybe towards other people, maybe towards our circumstances, but there's a lot that you're casting in each of our lives right now that has challenges, that has difficulties, that has all sorts of opportunities to forget that you're God and that you're sustaining all that comes to pass by your good providence. And so, Lord, call us back to yourself. Call us back to the fact that you've been faithfully present and you, uh, you will be faithfully present in this moment uh, by the Spirit. And so would you do that in Christ's name? Amen. Um. If, if you were to read through the scriptures from, from beginning to end, one of the things that you would find is that there are these great salvation experiences or deliverances that God gives his people, but then the aftermath of it still is not quite uh, totally remedied. And so an example of this would be, you know, the Jews were given the feast of the Passover, right when they were about to be annihilated by, by Egypt. And then literally for the next 40 years, they wander around in the desert. And God tells them, I want you to celebrate the Passover every single year to remember that I have saved you. Meanwhile, the Israelites are wandering around the desert and thinking like, saved us from what? Uh, to wander around in the desert? And God says, yes. And that's exactly the the function of the Feast of Purim. So the Jews are saved from evil Haman and the Persian Empire, but the original hearers of the book of Esther were under the reign of the Greeks. And the Greeks, if you read, if you read in the intertestamental period, Antiochus Epiphanes was not so great to God's people. And you're left thinking, if you read the Bible, if you just read history, like, if I believe in God, like, is this ever going to end? Like how hard my lot is, how hard my life is uh, currently in the, in the present. And that may be a question that, that you have right now. You may be thinking, you know, I, I, I believe in God, but it doesn't seem like that has changed my circumstances much at all. In, in fact, it may even be that when I believe in God, like my circumstances get even more challenging, even more, more difficult. 
Um, and this is what the book of Esther is about. How do you navigate that? How do you think about that? How do you think about your lot in life when you've had some experience of God in the past, but the present circumstance is like, uh, was that true? Like, did that really happen? And, and how, do I, how do I move forward? That's what the Feast of Purim is about. That's what all feasts, that's what all Sabbaths, that's what all holidays in Scripture are about. And that's what we're going to look at today. How has your lot been redeemed? And how do you keep remembering that? Okay? How has your lot been redeemed? Look at that first verse um, and then verse 22. I'm going to read the first verse again. Now, in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command edict were about to be carried out on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. Okay? The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. Okay, now skip down to verse 22, and it says this, As the days on which the Jews, so because of that, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, that word for relief means rest, it's where we get the name Noah from, some of, Noah, some of, some of you have Noah children in here, rest from the enemies, this is what you are to do, you are to remember that your sorrow was turned into gladness, and that your crying or your weeping was turned into a holiday, and you are to make this day a great feast and give gifts to one another and give gifts to the poor. Now, the name of, the name of our church is called Redeemer. And redemption is one of the core values of this church. What it means to be redeemed is that God has purchased you. He has bought you, and He's changed your story. Not just as a community, but as individuals. The problem with us as human beings, in our vision and mission statement, is that we are a community that's constantly being changed by the gospel. That's very intentional. What's also intentional is that human beings hate change. Did y'all know that? But that's what God intends to do. To mold us. To change us into an image of himself and not leave us to our self, which is embodied in the person of Haman. The human heart doesn't like change even when we think that we do because it means that we lose control and we have to rely on something outside of ourselves to depend on God. Now, we know even uh, if you think about your own life, you actually won't change unless you have come to the end of yourself. And there's a release of control. There's a release of like, I, well, I can't, I can't do this. There's a release of relying on the self. And we stop pushing against our lot in life. And this is why I want us to think about our lot in life. When you rest in the story that God has written for you, and you say, okay, I submit to the circumstances in which you've placed me in, both in my past story, but also my present. This is my lot. This is the hand that you dealt me, God. How do you want to play it? That's where God does his best work. And you can almost feel it, you know, like when your body, it, your body can release into the arms of another person. I think we can sort of feel that in our soul when we release into the providence of God and we sort of give up. This is where God does his best work. And what I want to encourage you to know today, guys, is that you do know how to change. It's in your, it's in your DNA. Not only as like our community, we've had a lot of uh, transition and turnover like in this particular community, but I want you to think about what does it mean to be a prairie folk? How do, you, how do you survive the western frontier? You adapt to the environment. That's what you do. It's in your blood. You, ha you have to constantly adapt to the weather, and you have to, as, as somebody who works the land, especially if you're farmers know this, by the way, you can't live in the past if you're a farmer because you've got a season coming for you. 
Kathleen Norris, the writer of Dakota, she says, if you hold on to what once was, you're sacrificing your future. Every, every person on the Western frontier knows that. And so you have to adapt. You have to change. And what, what God does in the midst of that, because that's hard, is that he gives us meals in memory in Scripture to mark the past in which he provided for you in order to prepare you for what's to come, the future adventure, the, the future challenge. And so now I want you to think about this for a moment in your own story. What is your lot? How, how may God have uh, shown up in a powerful way in your past? How might he be showing up to you currently? Now, again, we can think about this on a communal level, but I want us to think about it on a personal level for right now. Your experience of God in your own personal story, you're going to have to draw on that to face the present. You're going to have to rely on how God was faithfully present through that experience so that you can move forward in what God's calling you to in the present moment. So, for instance, there's a, a counselor, professor, professor, pastor type guy named Dan Allender, he said when he grew up, um, he knew just sort of on an unconscious level that his mom was erratic, emotionally erratic. And he knew that he had to keep the peace in the home. So his dad would send her into the bedroom, send him into her bedroom and calm her down when she was not well. Or around the dinner table when her, his mom would blow, blow a, a gasket, he, he would tell her stories to calm her down. And he just knew that that was the role, that was his lot as a little boy. And he said, I had to do things that no little boy should have to do to calm an adult down. And he said, you know, like, what evil used in my early life to harm me now, as a therapist, I see that God has used that to arm me to do what I do every single day, to help calm people down and to remind them that God's present. Something way beyond his pay grade as a little boy that, that was not good was used by God to be redeemed. Now, I want you to think about the Jews in this story. They're not like happy that they almost got annihilated by the Persians, but God used it. God used it in such a way that God says, I want you to actually mark it. I want you to mark it with a feast. Now, that's what we're called to do as believers in God, that we tell our stories of redemption all the time. Not, not to be inwardly focused, but we say, this is, this is what evil intended to do to harm me, and God didn't let it happen. In fact, he reversed it. In the very places that I thought it was the worst, God says, no, that's where I'm going to make you the most glad. That's where I'm going to fill you up. That's why Jesus calls himself the pleroma, the fullness that fills all in all. Because he fills up that, that which is lacking. Under the midst of horrible conditions, God turns our sorrow into, into gladness. And now, now this is, and I, I want this to be very practical, but this week and next week, this is exactly what, um, what we would call Sabbath, what Sabbath is for. Sabbath oftentimes is uh, translated as just ceasing or stopping. Um, another way to think about Sabbath is that God is filling you up. He's redeeming you. And it's an intentional practice of remembering that our stories have been redeemed. And that takes a lot of attention and focus. And that's what I want to talk to you about the rest of this, uh, this sermon. So how, how do you keep remembering that you have been redeemed? And this is, I just want to read 20 through 23 again, because it's so good. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Xerxes, both near and far, obliging them to keep, so they were going to celebrate the 14th day of the month of Adar, and also the 15th day of the same year by year, so this is an annual thing, as the days on which the Jews got rest from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned from them 
from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, and they should make them day, the days, uh, days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So Mordecai sent all these uh, letters out to the Jews telling them to keep the 14th day of March and sometimes the 15th to celebrate the days that the Jews got rest from their enemies and they are to make these practices of these sort of great reversals as uh, a memory of what God had done for them in the Persian Empire. Now originally again the Feast of Purim was for the Jews facing the violence of Greece. Now here's what I want to ask you. Uh, why is it important, especially when you're in the midst of very troubling and trying circumstances, why is it important to stop and remember? Part of it is, if you don't, uh, you will burn yourself out. Another part is that it's actually, it actually makes you more productive if you learn the rhythm of stopping and remembering. Um, feasting and intentional gladness is um, it's kind of like, you know, Abraham Lincoln said, if I have eight hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to use the first six to what? Sharpen the axe, right? The most important thing you do if you want to get stronger, many, many uh, fitness people will tell you this, the most important thing you do is that you sleep. You get good rest, that's what intentional remembering is, and that's what the Sabbath is for. It's a return to the wholeness of what it means to be a human being. It's a return to the wholeness of God's delight. And it's resting from your performance so that you can go and do the thing that you're called to do. Okay? So... For instance, let's say you are in the midst of some challenging thing right now that you, that you have to like face, but you know God has shown up to you in the past, but he hasn't yet quite in this thing that you're dealing with currently, right? That's the tension, by the way. That's the tension that we're all in. That's what it feels like to follow God. That's what it feels like to be a Christian. And the point is don't try to alleviate that tension, what you're called to do in the midst of that is to remember that God is present. And he gave you rest from your enemies in the past, whatever enemy that is, and he'll do it again, but you must wait. And what do we do while we wait? Well, sometimes we fast, but sometimes we feast. Feasting helps us. We holiday, we Sabbath, we Purim. That is, that is one of the areas that I think that we are super, as a, as a global society, we are super malnourished here. We, don't, we think we know how to feast, but we're not feasting. We think we know how to rest, but we're not resting. What we're doing is that we're inundated with everything, whether it's food or information. We become obese in our minds, and we're not yet smart still. Um, because we don't know how to properly rest. Finding joy in wholeness is very, very different than activities that you're constantly doing. It's very different than unplugging or taking the edge off, and it's very different than entertaining ourselves. Um, those things lead to consumption and laziness and busyness, but what the Scriptures give you a vision for, and this is what I get very excited to talk about, is restorative practices that can actually bring you wholeness, that can actually make you full. And here's how you know if you've tapped into it. Some of you um, can already, you'll, like if you just think about your life, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. When something is over, when you have consumed it, or when you've done a thing, does it leave you feeling full, glad, or hollow and empty? And many times you don't know it until after the fact of, of doing something. And this is why coming to worship is such an anomaly of an experience because even when 
you know, it's not ideal or the sermon's not that great or there's mistakes along the way or we don't have bulletins that match up to what we're, we're going through. Oftentimes, it's very rare. It's kind of like running in a way. It's very rare that after worship you think, man, I wish I hadn't have done that. Oftentimes, even when it's not that great, you, you walk away thinking, huh, I feel a little bit more full. And I am glad I did that. That's not because of uh, something about the church, but it's because your soul turned to God for even if, you, even if for a split moment and you say, okay, God, what do you have for me? And for a tiny little moment, you got full. You rested in his presence. I knew a bar owner once down in Texas, and he said he was exploring uh, becoming a church person. And he's like, you know, I own a bar. I'm not like the type of person that is like into God or the things of Christianity, but I believe in God. And I figured I can't hide from God, so I'll do both. And so he, they met in the evening, this Episcopal church, and he said... <clears throat> Each evening, he would have this reoccurring experience every Sunday. He would say, on the front end, I'd be like, I don't want to go. Like, I just don't want to go to church. And he would make himself go. And he said, every single Sunday, he would say, man, I'm glad I went. Now, why, why is that? It's because God works like the very opposite of everything else in the world. Everything else promises that it's going to fill you up and leaves you hollow and the aftermath, and God is the very, very diametrically opposite of that. It doesn't seem like it's doing much. I mean, he's not even here. He's like, he's invisible, right, is what we think. And we open ourselves up to him, and, and it's like, oh, that is who I am. And here's, here's the practice of feasting. Here's the practice of Sabbath. I want you to hear me carefully. A real feast under promises and over-delivers. That's what God does. He under-promises and over-delivers. And a fake feast, false consumption, over-promises and under-delivers. It's fun at first, but then it's hollow and sad. So right now, think about the things that you devote yourself to in the spaces of your life where you don't have any obligations. <clears throat> and some of you are like, I don't have any spaces like that. I challenge you. I challenge you to the mat, unless you're a young mom with young children, and then that's a hard season of life. And if you need pastoral care, talk to me or Adam or some of the older women in the church, and we'll try to pray for you. But that, that's hard. Um, but... You have space in your life, and you're carving it out for something. And here's the the vision that the Scriptures give to you. What if once a week you could do something that that would sustain you for six days and give you joy? As uh, one author says, who is pretty adamant about keeping a Sabbath, he says, I'm never more than six days away from a holiday at any given point in my week. How can we become intentional about remembering? What if for one day a week you committed yourself to something that you knew would bring you fullness? And some of you are thinking, all right, here comes the thing about y'all just need to get yourself to church. Like, that's part of it, but it's not nearly all. This is a way of life I'm discussing, not just like an hour and a half of your week. For instance, I, uh, I talked to a group of very accomplished college students once, many of whom went to like Ivy League schools, and I did this experiment with them. I said, okay, what, uh, what, what could you do right now? And, and I want you to think very specific. What could you do that would bring you absolute delight? Like you knew it. You could do a practice, you could do something, I'm not talking about just fun, but that makes you feel like a kid again, that makes you feel full. And y'all, the answers that I got, it was, it was amazing. Some of them were like um, Legos. It was like 21-year-old kids, right? Like in high-caliber schools. 
Some of them like horseback riding. Somebody said, take, take a really, really, really hot shower. They're like, it does it for me every time. Like, it's just awesome. It fills you up. And I was like, okay. Um, let's imagine you're in the middle of exam week. And it's like crunch time, and all you, all you can think about is like, I have, to, I have to do well on this test. And I asked the question, how many times during a week like that do you stop and do the thing that delights you? And they all said, that is impossible. Now, here's the point. I'm not talking about addictions here. I'm not talking about what my friend says about peanut butter M&Ms. He says, you know, I can make a peanut butter M&M do exactly what I want it to do. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intentional gladness. It's what the Psalms call simcha, okay? The oil of gladness. Here's the teaching on feasting. During those times of the highest stress of your life, during those times when it feels like life is just swallowing you whole, during the times it's like, I have, to, I have to do this thing or my, life is gonna, my lot is going to fall, that's when you need to go towards delight most. I would even say it's a life and death situation. And that's what I told the college students. And they were just like, oh, I can't do it. You're like, yes, you can. You better. Because what you're doing in those moments, you guys, is that you think that this is all that there is to me. This is all, like, I have to get this grade. I have to meet this deadline. I have to be there for my kids. I have to take this person that, you know, and, and what you're forgetting is that, hey, God loves you. Despite all that, you can let some of that slide. You go towards delight, not to avoid it, but to go back into it with a full heart. Go back into it with somebody that believes the gospel. This is why, you guys, this is why busyness and running around everywhere and money and drugs are so devious because they promise rest on the front end, but they leave you hollow and drugged out and wanting more on the back end. And worshiping God is the exact opposite. <laughs> it's the exact opposite because you're thinking, this ain't working. And the Lord says, try me. Try me. Open yourself up to me and see what happens. Don't, don't take my word for it. You take it up with the Almighty. Do the thing that brings you delight. And He promises to be present to you. Now look, some of you already in your mind know that if you were that free, you know what you would do today, this afternoon. You know it. What's stopping you? A little extra money? Somebody being disappointed in you? A kid not getting to one of their games? A B plus instead of an A? God says, try me. Come to him. And delight yourself in rich food that does not spoil. Now, how does, how does feasting and giving to the poor go together? Because it also says we ought to give to the poor. It's because when you give to the poor, what you're doing is that you're restoring somebody's fullness, their wholeness, and their dignity. You are helping them remember who they truly are instead of the lot that's been cast for them in their life. God literally says in Proverbs 19.17 that when you open your hand to the poor, you open your hand to Him. Which, that alone is amazing. If you want a Sabbath practice, just go down the street in Lincoln and befriend a homeless person and let them teach you about God. The joy you get when your lack is filled by someone, when they didn't expect it. You know, if you've ever been a missionary, if you ever raised support, you, you can speak about this. When somebody gives you an exorbitant amount of money, it's the most tangible experience of the gospel in this life. And each of us in, in here, we have people in, in our lives that like would love to spend time with us. Maybe that's the poor in your life right now. 
Maybe that's an intentional Sabbath practice that we need to give ourselves to. Somebody who needs a friend. The poor understand the gospel and what those who have extra participate in when we give ourselves to those in need is the giving and receiving of the oil of gladness, that simha. And we are free to give and receive on both ends because we are all going to sit down at the table with God himself and enjoy his delight because Jesus will fill you up. Um, As we come to a close, I do think it was highly intentional that the very first miracle that Jesus chose to reveal who he was was restoring a wedding feast. And he did it in such a cool way. You know, he took these ceremonial cleansing jars of water and he filled them with a lot of wine, like a lot. Um, And the reason why is because he doesn't want you to have a scarcity mentality. He doesn't want you to always be anxious. He doesn't want you to be worried. He doesn't want you to think that you can't go after the things that delight you in your short life. But he wants you to practice what it means to be in his presence because that is your reality a billion years from now. And you practice resurrection, you practice your eternal reality when you give yourself over to the things that you know will fill you up, that you know will delight you. And you might be like, yeah, but you don't know how bad my life is. Like, yeah, that's true. I don't. But here's what I do know. God made you for himself. And he made you to not always live in fear. And he made you to not be too busy or worried to sit down and enjoy your life. And he made you to feast with him. That's why he gives us the table. And the simple invitation this morning is, do you want to? Do you want to feast with God? What's holding you back? The invitation at this table is to let those excuses of not coming to God, just turn those excuses down just a little bit for a moment. Let them go silent here at this table, if just for a moment. And remember that God delights in you. That's why Christ came, so that you could be at rest in God's presence. And that's what the gospel is about, that he is moving us towards this great feast. Uh, We'll have one more week in the book of Esther where we'll kind of uh, talk a little bit more about that theme. Um, I'm going to pray, and I'm actually going to do the confession assurance, and Thomas is going to do the table because I don't want to get you all sick. I'm a little sick this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your kindness. We thank you for the Sabbath, Lord, for giving us um, one day a week where we get to delight ourselves in you. And so, Lord, would you show us what it means um, to be okay with that? It's not just that you gave us permission to do it, but you call us towards Sabbath. You call us towards feasting. Um, You call us towards uh, knowing that all the things that we long for, whether it's in our activities, or our marriages, or our divorces, or our addictions. Lord, it's all a longing for you. And so, Lord, would you satiate us? Would you satisfy us? In Christ's name, amen. All right, guys, uh, one of the things we do every single week is that after we hear the word, we do recognize like, oh, there are some things that I need to come clean about with God. And that is not something to necessarily be ashamed of. That's actually uh, what our confession calls a gift of grace, that we get to repent. And so that's why we confess our sins. This isn't something where we beat ourselves over our back and feel really bad about ourselves, but it's a way of posturing ourselves so that we can uh, be be empty enough to receive the, the grace of God. And so that's why we confess sin. We do that together. And so Uh, We'll read this together, spend some moments in silence, and hear some assurance of forgiveness. And so read this with me. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. 
Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, we, uh, we confess our sin to you. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus into the world and that you apply his work by the Spirit so that we can know that our weeping will be turned into joyous delight. And Lord, those who, uh, those who sow um, in tears will come home with shouts of joy when they know your son Jesus. And so, Lord, that's the gospel story. That's the gospel story we seek to inhabit in our lives personally, but also as we go out into the city of Lincoln this week, that we would hold out that hope to others and know that the resurrection will come and the feast with you will come. And so would you encourage uh, your people here with these words this morning in Christ's name, amen. The assurance of... uh, I would call this the assurance of faith this morning. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whoever, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows in his flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows in the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let not those who grow weary of doing good For in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. Thanks, Matt. Um, So we come now to a time in our service where we remember what Matt was talking about. Um, This is something that is kind of baked into the Christian life, a, a feast of remembrance. And here at Redeemer, we celebrate this every single week. Uh, I don't know if you've had the experience of going over to someone's house who is just an extremely good host. Um, it's They anticipate what you need and articulate it in ways that you can't even possibly understand. Um, I remember I had a friend uh, named Brendan who was a, a really good cook. A um, little background for this might be helpful. I was raised in a very white bread house as far as food goes. We don't do exotic foods. Uh, and so I go over to my friend Brendan's house and he introduces me to bacon-wrapped dates. Uh, that was very exotic for me. I had no idea why you would put cream cheese in a date, wrap it in bacon, bake it, and it's really good. And I was very hesitant to eat this food uh, until he comes up to me and he says, Thomas, trust me. Trust me. And I had it, and it was amazing. Uh, that same dynamic is kind of what's happening here at this table. Uh, I want you to, to just recognize that the Lord himself is a great host, that he knows you better than you know yourself, and that you might not even understand really fully what's happening here, but God himself is coming to you in this table, putting his arm around you and saying, trust me, I know what you need. So this meal is a remembrance of Jesus' one true sacrifice, and, and through it, he actually does nourish us. So if you claim Jesus... And by claim, I just mean receiving and resting in him alone. Then this meal is for you. If that's not yet a reality in your life, uh, we're so glad that you're here. But we want you to consider what would it look like to claim Jesus before you come to this table and to be claimed by him. Um, So I'm going to set the elements apart, pray, and then we'll welcome the the worship band up first. Uh, If you want grape juice, it's on the outer ring here. Uh, Wine is on the interior. Um, So... 
Uh, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray and ask that you would take these ordinary elements, this bread and this cup, and that you would use them to preach the gospel to us in ways that are deeper than we can understand. Lord, will you use this to nourish us, to fill us with new obedience? Uh, Lord, I I know many of us come uh, to this table limping. Many of us come to this table uh, uncertain of where we are. Lord, I pray that you would use this to fill us up. Lord, may we remember who you are and what it is that you have done for us. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick pause. Going to need some help. I think, Steve, why don't you come up here and help me? Here we go. Awesome, brother. Thanks for jumping in there. All right, you are welcome. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah, hallelujah, thou wast there. Their fortress and their might, thou Lord, their captain. In the well fought fight, thou in the darkness drear, their one true light. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, may thy soldiers, faithful, true. Fight as the saints who nobly fought of old and win them with the victors, crown of gold, hallelujah, hallelujah, the golden evening brightens in the west, soon, soon to fade. Bounds from oceans far this coast 
through gates of pearl, streams in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this meal. We ask that it would uh, fill us up this week, the feast of what's to come. Lord, the great wedding feast of the Lamb, when we will be raised from the dead. And there will be no more tears of sadness, and all things that are sad will become untrue. And so, Lord, that's why we sing, that's what we hope in, because of Jesus Christ, the first fruits of the new creation. And so help us to uh, sing in Him, in Christ's name, amen. I look forward to receive the benediction. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in grace and peace.